Hello again, and welcome to a financial thought leadership podcast, Banking on Experience, sponsored by CRM Next, the banking CRM, where we simplify work, drive growth, and deliver on experience. This podcast is meant to empower individuals working in the financial industry with stories, experiences, and knowledge straight from the source. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, and stay tuned for an awesome show. Welcome to another episode of Banking on Experience. I'm your host, James Gilbert. Super excited to be joined by Laurie Madalina today. We are going to be talking about an open discussion on becoming a leader with little to no experience. It's going to be interesting today because we're going to be talking about like those that get put into a leadership position and maybe don't have any people training. So we're going to hopefully drop some truth bombs today. Laurie is the CEO and Chief Leadership Consultant at Envision Excellence. She is a certified executive coach and provides management training and leadership assessments. Welcome to the show, Laurie. Thanks, James. Great to be here. If there could be one thing that you would change the world with, what would you do? I think, well, there's so many things that are coming to mind, but I think just based on, you know, the work that I do in the world, I think it would be teaching people at a young age how, what their strengths are, what's important to them, how to have self-regard and and success principles that can lead them through life. I think if we had those skills, I think can think of many skills that I wish I had had at a younger age that you learn through wisdom. So if we could teach young people, I think even financial skills too, like all of these skills that help would help them lead a better life and get, give them a head start in life, that we would have a lot of productive human beings and people who love themselves in this world who can make a difference. I find it so fascinating how the young, younger generations that are now grooming up to come up to the to, into the business world and becoming the leaders of what what was the past now the future, how very few of them have actually had training mm-hmm. on those things. Something as simple as emotional intelligence, which 15 years ago none of us even knew what the heck that was, right? Right. It's so interesting to me how like life has developed to a point where we actually have people like yourself that are experts in these things that can actually teach people the good things that you know you can train yourself on so let's let's just dive right into it why why this topic why why are you passionate about this well i really think that people spend most of their time at work and a lot has changed in the world things are evolving i think particularly over the past 18 months with covid we're seeing even more of an evolution of what people want at work But even before that, leaders play such an important role in the lives of every human being. I can't think of any position or any company that doesn't have leaders. And so uh, I think a lot of companies are really struggling right now. There's, you know, the great resignation, people leaving organizations and attracting and keeping really great people. And so it's never been harder, in my opinion, to be a leader than it is in today's environment. And many people struggle being leaders, myself included, when I first became a leader, I didn't have any skills. No one sat me down and taught me what it meant to be a leader, what the expectations were. I was just kind of thrown into the deep end and said, you know, now you're a supervisor. Um, And I think we do a poor job in, in many ways of preparing people for this important role in life. The only other thing I can think of we don't prepare people for is parenting. We kind of just throw them in. <laughs> you know, I don't know. They sent me home with a kid one day and I was like, oh my gosh, you have to learn by experience, right? You just put yourself in there and you learn every day. And unfortunately we do the same with leaders many times. So I think there's a great opportunity for organizations to really be much more proactive and deliberate about their leadership talent so that they can create environments where people love to come to work. I think leadership for the longest time, you know, kind of got put on a pedestal of like, all right, well, you've reached this certain point in your career. So pretty much you can treat anyone however you want. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that it was that way for a long time and kudos to the world for changing that, right? Because now you're, you're right. It is much harder to be a leader now than it ever has been. And I think some of it is because of that. Some of it is because now you have to navigate situations that are much more unique than they used to be. Like you you do really have to understand who you're leading. 
you mm-hmm. know, their personalities and not, not just that, but you, there, there's dynamics and bias that you have as a leader and you have to accept the fact you have it. Yeah. And you have to know, learn about yourself, right. And how, you know, self-awareness is one of the keys to exceptional leadership. And so the more we learn about ourselves and how that impacts who we lead and learn about our employees, you know, what you were describing of the, the tra- I call this traditional leadership, where in years past, you kind of worked your way up and then you were granted this position of leadership. And you thought, or many leaders at least thought, well, I'm the expert. I know it all. I'm here to tell people what to do. And, and as you mentioned, James, a lot has evolved over in our cultures, even over the past 30 years of we have more women in the workplace and the dynamics of the home family are changing. We have more two parent households now. A lot of men even want to be more involved in their kids' lives. And so all of this evolution, I think, in our society is causing this shift in our organizations of what employees want. Mm -hmm. And it started, I believe, a big shift with the millennial uh, generation coming in. And many people thought, oh, well, they're entitled and they want all these things. I think it was the shift of our culture, the evolution of what that generation said, wait a minute, I don't want to just come to work and, and be thought of as just a, a resource and not have anyone really take an interest in me and my development. I, I want to feel like I'm making an impact. I want meaning. I want to feel a connection with the company. It's not just about money. And so all of this evolution is changing the expectations of what people want at work today. And that's why leadership needs to evolve with it. It's something that I think that it's often overlooked. People often will leave a job because of their leader more than they'll leave a job for anything else, right? So there's always that notion of like, well, th- they leave their boss, not not the company, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I've always taken that to heart, right? Because sometimes I've actually helped people grow out of the company into a more prominent yeah. role that, you know, was helpful for them. And I think as we as leaders, regardless in any situation that you're in, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a coach, whether you're, uh, you know, a CEO, whether you're, whether you're a manager of one person, it makes no difference. Your goal is to impact their life for the positive. And if you can do that, that is how we make a change in the world for the positive. And I truly believe that with that type of mentality, you know, good things will happen always. Laurie, talk to me, what can financial institutions do to help start grooming um, future leaders? One of the things I think financial institutions need to do is to stop promoting people for technical expertise. Now, many of those people could be great leaders and probably are great leaders or have the competency to be great leaders. Not all of them do. And so, you know, I really think we need to be more purposeful about our talent development and think through, well, first, help people understand what it means to be a leader. So what you're talking about, that service side, right, of, of being more of a servant and making an impact on people, I believe you actually have to like people a little bit to be a leader. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I've experienced some managers and executives who just do not like people. And maybe not every day, right? We all have our days. But you, you need to be able to enjoy the human development people side of business, because that's really what leadership is all about. So One, I call this giving people a peek behind the curtain. Before they're in leadership roles, give them an idea of what it means to be a leader. So an example is many people don't realize how many tough conversations they'll have to have when they're in a leadership role. And I know for me, this was something that was surprising to me when I became a leader is it was much harder than I expected. I kind of had this fantasy idea in my mind of, oh, I'm finally going to, you know, work my way up and become a leader and I'll finally have my ideas implemented and be in charge. And I wasn't a terrible leader, but I didn't really think about all of the important aspects of being influential and facilitating performance. So I really think organizations need to think through before you promote, making sure we're letting people know what's expected, let them opt out if they want to, because not everybody wants to be a leader. So let them know what it entails. And then those who choose to go on that path, we need to 
prepare them and train them before they move into that role. Now there's many people, myself included, who didn't have that experience of being trained before. And certainly I've seen, I've had people in leadership programs who have been leading 20 years. And they've said, if I knew this skill, if I knew how to coach people or you know, how to work with people and influence them in this kind of way 20 years ago, wow, that would have been amazing. So you can train people now who haven't had it, but I think the best for the future as we're build, building our talent pools, if we can provide that development and training beforehand so that people feel prepared going into those roles and they're set up for success rather than failure. I think sometimes the training piece and teaching and coaching people to be a better leader oftentimes is, is not done because of fear of the current leader. Fear that they're going to take over their job. Fear that they're going to be seen as insignificant. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you address this fear? Yeah. So I, I think helping people understand what those competencies are, that when you build your talent pool, if you have someone who understands a piece of the, the department or what you're you know, what you're focused on better than you, that that makes you look good, right? Like that's the whole point in leadership is to help facilitate the best performance of your employees. And I think the traditional leader thinks of that as a threat of, uh -huh. oh, I'm going to be out of a job. Oh, I've got to be the, the knower of all the answers. I'm the person who has to be the smartest. And right away, I think that's an indication of lower emotional intelligence of you're focused on the wrong things. You know, if you're focused on bringing in people who have these talents, they make you look good. And if you can master the, the people side of engaging them at a level where they're productive and they want to bring their best effort to work every day, you know, your story of, of the kid who want, wants to play basketball is a great story because you were relating that to when we develop people, even if they leave us. As a leader, you've done your job, right? I've had this experience too, where I've someone wanted a position that maybe we didn't have in the department. And yet I wanted to invest in that person and groom them so that if they left to go somewhere else or transfer departments, that's still success. Yeah. You're taking an interest in them as a person and helping them find what's right for them, the right fit for them. And that's what great leaders do. And so it's a shift in mindset, I think, for many people, because that traditional mindset, again, is, is about the all-knower having the answers. And the modern mindset is more about facilitating performance. So you're not a fixer. You're not the all-knower. You're a facilitator of bringing out the best performance in a team to help get the results that you need. I think another area that um, becomes impactful um, at just about every organization is you have to have a culture that's willing to put people that and, and expose them to areas that normally they wouldn't. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. It's very rare that somebody who is trying to reach a C-level actually gets to be in C-level discussions. Yes. So those are some barriers we have to break down also as leaders and as organizations culturally, bringing people. Uh, one thing that I, uh, and by the way, this is super passionate for me too, because it, I wish that I would have had, I had one leader my entire career who did it the right way. And he put me in a position to where it just skyrocketed my career. He allowed me to come in. I mean, I, I have always focused on like data. That's part of who I am and, and I love it. And so I, I would have a lot of insight that I could provide different functions of the organization. So he would actually bring me into some of the C-suite discussions and then they found, well, he provides a lot of value and there's lots of stuff that we can get out of him. And so I, I ended up getting promoted and that's what fast tracked my career to, to being in a, in, a, in a C title, right? And I think that it's so hard to get there unless the path is open, but also I was never taught, like I, I had people that I managed, but I was never taught real people skills in an organization. That's a great point, James, because I, you know, what you're talking about, it, it's also the experiential part, right, of, of that leader gave you, opened up the door to you having these C-suite discussions. And, and I think back to my own career, the VP I had before I became a VP, I was a director, she opened up that door for me as well of, 
coming and presenting to the board of directors. So, you know, typically it was the VPs who did that, not a director or manager. And she opened that door for me of, I want you to get this experience. And, and to, to your point, I think that's a really important piece of developing people to that next level is what are also the experiential pieces, whether it's going to a board meeting or an executive meeting or being involved in those discussions or presenting your ideas in front of people to give people those opportunities as they're developing to start to hone those skills, right? And so even if it's speaking in front of people or as you're talking about people skills, making sure we're giving people those opportunities and experiences to do that on the job before they get into that role even. Yeah, and I know that we didn't we didn't um, talk too much on the technical um, expert being promoted. And I, I wanna come back to that really fast. You know, I think that there's, there's a notion, right? That like, just because you're an expert in your role and the specifics of your role that all of a sudden like you can be promoted. And there is some truth to that, right? Mm -hmm. You wanna reward people, but I also think that you have to gauge their interests in managing people before just throwing them um, into a people manager role. Yeah. And I think that organizations also culturally have to allow a path for both and allow people to say, hey, look, I, I really, don't want to manage people, but I would like to continue to move up. You have to allow both. So what do you think financial institutions can do to allow that? Yeah, I, that's a really important piece because traditionally the next step is a leadership role. And as you pointed out, you know, the challenge with that is one, not everyone wants to do that. And people still want to be able to grow and develop. It's a human need for, for us to want to consistently be growing and developing. And so, you know, if you have a network administrator and they don't enjoy the people side or managing, find a way, how do you make it one, two, and three, or, you know, some sort of elevation for that person to continue to grow. I had an HR generalist once who was one of my best employees. And my CEO kept pressuring me, you need to make her a manager. She's so great at what she does. And she would say to me, she said, Lori, I don't want to be a manager. I don't want to do what you're doing. I don't like managing people. And I really, I just told her this recently. I said, I admire that about you because you knew what you were capable of, but also what you enjoyed and what was really your path. And so finding ways for her to consistently develop in that role without having to be a supervisor was really important to keep that talent. You know, the as you said, some technical people who are great in technical superstars can succeed in leadership. I'm certainly not saying that if you have technical abilities, you're not going to be a great leader. What I'm, what I'm saying is that the shift is different. The competencies and skills in a leadership role are different. And this is what I find that holds people back many times when they get into a leadership role is they continue to believe that their technical expertise is the value they bring to the organization. And the value now in a leadership role is the leadership competencies, the ability to develop, coach, bring out the best in those people, spend time, I call it caretaking the culture, creating clarity for people. That's the important piece. And many people struggle to make that leap and shift when they move into that role. And so really helping them see and making sure that, again, that people who we are promoting identify and understand the value in their new role as a leader and then giving them those tools so that they can do that successfully. There's one word you mentioned that I want to double down on. And that's that um, your HR generalist, you, you said, you know, I admire this about you because you really narrowed in on what you're passionate, passionate about. I think this is a very way too often overlooked skill from a leader to just ask that simple question. What are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. Because I have done this now with several people on my teams and I found a technical marketing writer who actually was passionate about web development. Sometimes people, we have to realize this, sometimes people are on a path and they started that path and found they really don't want to be on that path, but they don't know how to get out of it. And we as leaders have to get to the root cause. What are they passionate about? I've had developers turn into designers. 
Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can be two ends of the spectrum and we have to allow that to happen and realize that maybe who we hire, even for a specific role, there could be change there. So we have to be agile as an organization to do that. What would be your advice to people who run into this situation? Yeah, I think one is we need to get to know each employee, as, as you said, of understanding their passions, what they want to do. And, and you know, you, you talked about kind of opening up this, this world for people. And sometimes they don't even know yet what they want to do in their career. I mean, I think back to my early career in my 20s, and I had no, I, I graduated with a general communication, speech communication degree. I really had no idea what I wanted to do or what I was good at. And so part of that, and I was very fortunate that when I finally started working for a credit union in my early 20s, that I had th these opportunities to kind of see what I liked. I started in the call center as the assistant manager, and I realized I loved the side of people there. And so I ended up shifting into HR, but I was allowed to explore that and given that opportunity. So getting to know your employees individually so you can show them this other world. I can think of so many examples of what you just said of where I think back to my credit union days, we had someone who was in the branch in a member service role and he had an IT background and we had an IT position open up and it was because the manager was talking with this employee that he happened to mention, hey, I have an IT background and when we went back and looked at his resume, there it was, it was in there, right? And so we, we were able to have that person apply, ended up transferring over to IT. There could be talents throughout the organization that you don't even realize people have. And the only way you get to know those things is by having conversations, creating those connections with people, understanding what they value, what's important to them, and sometimes helping them see what they're good at. Sometimes you as a leader can identify what that is for a person better than they even can so that they can see other possibilities for their career development. I love the StrengthsFinder uh, assessment from the Gallup organization. Some people criticize it saying, well, you can't just focus all on your strengths. I think the whole point of that assessment is to understand better about what your talents and strengths are. And you certainly have to manage weaknesses but it can help people get a clue into what are the things that I'm good at and really be more self-reflective about that. Yeah, it's interesting because people sometimes will reveal their passions in their conversations, but they can't always um, translate that to action. That's the key is we as leaders have to help them translate it to action. Larry, what, what are one to two things that credit unions and financial teachers can do to adjust their approach to leadership? Well, you, you mentioned earlier, James, that the manager is usually the reason why people leave their organizations and very true. I mean, research says it's 50% of the time that people leave their manager. I think it could even be more than that. Right now, we see people leaving a lot because they feel overworked, overwhelmed. They're trying to balance their lives. It's the great resignation. I just read an article yesterday that said now those now more people are leaving because colleagues have left and they're left with the work. So, you know, some, hey, my colleagues, I had a few colleagues resign and now more work is on me. My manager is expecting me to do more with less. And so now I'm gonna leave because I'm not doing that, right? So one, I think that as organizations, again, we need to be more proactive and think about how, first of all, what's the unique thing that we offer our, our employees? And what benefits do we have? What do our employees value? You know, asking your employees, understanding that flexibility is really high on the list right now for employees, what they want. And that looks different for every organization. It doesn't mean that every position has to be 100% virtual. I think there's many ways we can be flexible, even in member service or customer service roles, um, but really being purposeful about that. And thinking about what are we willing to shift? I think the organizations that are reflective right now and use this as a time to redesign how their culture or their workplace, what work is and how that looks and think about what are the benefits that are really valuable to our staff right now based on what we know. If you get ahead of that, you'll be able to then attract really great talent because it's hard to find right now. They have choices. And so the organizations that kind of 
dig in their heels and say, well, no, this is the way we're going to work. I had to be in the office five days a week and my employees are going to be in the office five days a week. You have that prerogative if you're a CEO, yet I would encourage CEOs and executives to really rethink how can you create an environment where people feel that they can invest their energy where they want to invest their energy and not where they feel like it's just a job collecting a paycheck. Because I think we'll see as, I think it's going to take several years for this to to really play out. I think of the pandemic, there are a lot of negatives, but a good thing is that it's, it's shifting how we're thinking about work and employees are showing that they want something different. And the organizations that are going to do really well coming out of this are the ones who will listen to that and adjust and redefine their approach. Otherwise, other organizations, I think, will really struggle. It's so fascinating to me how sometimes it boils down to the simplest of terms of, wow, you actually need to listen to your employees. (laughs) It sounds so, I mean, it sounds so simple, right? And yet it just, it amazes me how many leaders still don't do it. You know, I feel like a, a lot of listening, taking an interest in people, building connections, it sounds so obvious, yet it's not practiced. It's not practiced for many. I mean, a lot of leaders are out there doing the right things, but for many people, it's not their comfort zone. It's not what they love to do. They kind of like, you know, hanging back and doing the work behind the scenes. And so I think that's another thing where we need to make sure leaders understand that you need to engage with people on a regular basis. Some people struggled with the virtual environment because they already didn't love connecting with people. And now it took a lot more energy and effort. And so I've seen that where, you know, some managers kind of hung back and didn't really communicate with their employees much during the pandemic. And and that's a mistake. I mean, we need people who really see the value in those connections and building those relationships. So what about leaders today that maybe heard something on this podcast or have heard in conversations with their leaders that, you know, they struggle in some of these areas? Mm -hmm. How do they address it um, for themselves so that they can become a better leader? I would say one is if you're not receiving feedback from your manager And this is another thing that managers, many managers struggle with is providing meaningful, relevant feedback to employees is to to ask your manager. And I suggest to people to really narrow the question. So instead of going to your manager and saying, hey, can you give me feedback? That's like a really big ask. It's very overwhelming, especially for a manager who's not accustomed to and hasn't been giving feedback regularly. Most likely if they're not doing that because it's uncomfortable. And so if you go to your manager and and maybe give them a heads up and say, you know, hey, I really want to to know what I should work on this coming year. Can you tell me one thing I'm doing really well that I should continue? And one thing that you think I should do more of or I need to improve on. When you narrow the question, it makes it much easier for the person to answer. So I'd say that's one thing. The other is if you are not getting that development at work, One could be advocating for it with your manager, if you still aren't getting it, to go outside and look, how can you do this on your own? You know, there's many avenues. I mean, there's so many videos and blog posts, and there's a lot of information out there. There's wonderful books. There's programs that you can get involved in, even on your own. I know I had to do that. I did that for HR before I even moved into HR. I took a class on my own and really wanted to prepare myself because it wasn't available at that time at my organization. So my advice would be to take ownership of that. It's wonderful if you have a great leader who will take interest in you and help you and develop that with you. Not everyone has that in their organization. So if you don't find those ways, those avenues, even outside of work or another leader, maybe who would mentor you in your your organization. Laurie, we are at time. Tell people where they can reach you in case they want to reach out to you for maybe one of these, where you come into their organization and help them. Yeah, absolutely. They can reach me on LinkedIn. Also my website, lauriemadalina.com. And I'm on Instagram now. I'm getting used to posting. I'm, I'm getting with the time. So <laughs> feel free to connect with me over on Instagram as well. I, I'm on Facebook. Um, certainly people can connect with me there, but, um, I I'm on Instagram. It's not as, it's not as a draw for me, I guess. I think I have like a few posts. I'm trying to get better about it. (laughs) 
It has been fantastic having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us.